Welcome back to Tech Notes. We're going to continue our Tech Notes by talking a little bit about ductwork and airflow. The pictures and examples that I use in these Tech Notes are real life situations that I've been called in to assess over the course of the past two or three years. So why do we care about airflow? Basically because if you do not test, you do not know. Airflow is the most often found problem when I do third-party system evaluations. Part of the problem is that over time ductwork is modified, might be replaced, might be damaged. Sometimes we do installations without proper design. And sometimes there's a lack of knowledge on the part of the installation and sales team. Improper airflow, which in turn a lot of times is caused by improper ductwork, can cause high energy bills, lack of cooling, lack of dehumidification, strain on equipment and equipment failure, and customer frustration. It can also cause damage to a company's or technician's reputation, can lead to insurance claims and legal issues. And the one that I don't have on here that's actually pretty important is the health and safety of your customer. So let's just take a minute and refuse some air pressure basics. Air will always move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure unless mechanical means are used to reverse that. In other words, a fan or blower motor. Air pressure readings are always taken with respect to a neighboring area. So in, in the blue ball here on the screen, if I have 100 PSI, and if my pressure surrounding that is 10 PSI, when I take a pressure measurement of the air in that ball, it's going to be 90 PSI. Because again, air pressure measurements are always taken with respect to a neighboring area. So if this air pressure surrounding the ball was 0 PSI, then I would see the full 100 PSI. It's a comparison reading. Refrigerant pressures are in PSI, pounds per square inch. And again, if you're listening to this from overseas and you use the metric system, it's going to be a little bit different. This is for the standard system. Okay, Air pressures in ductwork, vents, and equipment are in inches of water column. Air pressures in buildings are in pascals. Again, refrigerant pressures, pounds per square inch. Pressures in ductwork, vents, and equipment, inches of water column. Air pressures in buildings are in pascals. You're going to hear me refer to static pressure. So let's quickly talk about static pressure. It's the outward pressure of air. Air presses out on any object at right angles to the surface. It does not include the pressure of the movement of the air, which is velocity pressure. Air in a car tire is static pressure. It's not moving. It has no velocity. Air in ductwork, because it's moving, has both static and velocity pressure. Static pressure is the total pressure minus the velocity pressure. So if we take a look at my little diagram here, I have air blowing through the ductwork. If I measure the pressure of the air in this airstream, I'm getting total pressure. So what I have to do is remove the pressure of the air moving to find the static pressure, which is the outward pressure against the sides of the ductwork or equipment. Static pressure is taken with a manometer or magnahelic gauge. This is an example of a static pressure probe. It allows you to take the static pressure in ductwork and equipment. It connects to the manometer or magnahelic gauge and actually does that re comparison. It removes the um, velocity pressure from the measurements. This is an example of a magnahelic gauge for those who haven't seen one. It's simple. It's a dial with a gauge. It's not robust. You don't want to let it allow it to fall or roll around in a truck, but it is by far the most accurate method of taking pressure readings as long as the gauge hasn't been dropped. 
digital man manometers are robust and accurate as long as the batteries are good. This is a very important point for all digital tools. The batteries have to be good. As soon as the batteries start getting weak, your readings aren't going to be good anymore. They have positive and negative ports, so you can take differential readings, like comparison of two different pieces of ductwork. You have multiple outputs and pressure ranges that are available. Smart probes are the latest technology. Bluetooth technology that connects it to a handheld device. It allows recording and reporting of trends and results. So, back to airflow. Air wants to flow in a straight line. Air does not like corners. Air has resistance and air has weight. Why do I stress that air does not like corners? Well, this is my airstream coming in here, okay? I have air coming in the ductwork following the orange arrow. Air is going to want to go into this straight line. It's going to want to keep going. When it hits this spot, it's not going to make a clean curve. It's not going to do what we want it to do and curve down the ductwork. It doesn't know to do that. It's going to hit this spot and create velocity and turbulence right there. Turbulence causes resistance. It causes incorrect airflow. And it can actually change the static pressure and the overall air availability and capability of a system. Okay, sharp 90 degree corners are not good for airflow. Air has weight. Something important to remember, air has weight. It has resistance. It does not like corners and it wants to flow in a straight line. Now, a couple other basics we have to talk about. Air conditioning is designed to require 400 CFM, that's cubic feet of minute, for each ton of it capacity. A ton of capacity is 12,000 BTUs per hour. The pressure and the velocity of the air matters as well. Basic requirements can be found on the equipment data plate. That could be on your air handler or your furnace. If the system's not within design conditions, it's not going to work properly and can cause damage. Okay, this is an example of an equipment data plate. Yes, I have blocked out the full serial number for privacy reasons. The model number shows that this is a six-ton air handler. Okay, you can always find it in the model number on most pieces of equipment. 072 tells me it's a 72,000 BTU per hour. Divide that by 12, and it tells me it's a six-ton piece of equipment. The first part of the serial number, you have a 5.6 and then you have a 1.8. It shows me it was manufactured in 2018. It's a relatively new piece of equipment. So based on the data plate of 6 tons, I need 400 CFM per ton for a total of 2,400 CFM of air. 2,400 cubic feet of air per minute. Now, there's one other thing we have to find on the data plate. I want to know what the unit was tested at for external static pressure. Okay, unit shows it's been rated for 1.0 inches water column total external static pressure. Okay, and again, I'm blocking serial numbers for privacy reasons. So 2,400 CFM of air is a total external static pressure of 1.0 inches water column or under. So, why does this all matter? This all goes into blower motor performance, evaporator performance, ductwork performance, and total system performance. So, I've mentioned a few times total external static pressure. What is it? Okay, we take a pressure reading of the supply air. Okay, we take a pressure reading of the return air and we drop the positive or negative signs to get our absolute value, and we add the numbers together. Let me show you an example. So in this case, we're taking a pressure reading, and the probe's right there in the supply duct, 0 0.06 inch water column. Okay, right there, 0 0.06. Return duct, pressure out of the same system. This is out of the same system. Okay, pressure reading is in the probes right there in the return plenum. 
we have a negative 0.124 static pressure. So to get our total external static pressure, we take our return static and our supply static, drop the signs, and add them together. So my total external static pressure is 1.3 inches water column. Now if you remember right from our data plate, they wanted 1.0 max is what the unit was, was rated at. We have a problem. Okay, not a big problem, but it's enough to make a difference. So, when you find a problem with external static pressure, you need to do a quick evaluation. First of all, is it a drastic enough problem that it's going to make a difference? Are there already problems in the building that you're looking at? Is one side, the supplier return, much greater or much lower than the other side? Are there any obvious issues that could be causing this? What are the possible solutions? So in our example, the supply was 0.06. The return was 1.24. The return static pressure is almost 20 times, 21 times greater than the supply static pressure. That's a problem. What could be causing the low supply static? Because 0.06 is a low supply static. Well, we need to find the air leaks in the supply ductwork that go beyond the fan capacity, but we also might have a lack of air into the fan from the return duct. Okay, There might not be enough air coming from the return, so I need to do a ductwork inspection. But what could be causing excessive return static pressure? While I'm looking at ductwork, I may as well look at both. We could have restricted air filters, dirty air filters, primary cause. We could have restrictions in the ductwork. We could possibly have restrictions in a coil, but my static pressure readings were taken under the coil. It was before the coil. We could have undersized ductwork. We could have airflow issues in the return ductwork or design issues. So let's take a quick look at the supply ductwork. Okay, this just is a picture of what I found on the supply ductwork. Supply takeoffs right near the unit. I mean, right off the unit's supply plenum with no registers or balancing dampers. This is going to lower the supply pressure drastically. It's going to act like a big hole in the ductwork. But it still does not explain the high return static pressure. So we want to take a look at the filters. Okay, filters are clean. There's three filters in the system. Yes, I do have a little bit of a concern about not enough surface area, but it's not enough of a problem to cause this imbalance. Okay, and by I did pull the filters out, and we weren't, it didn't change much at all. So, I continue with my inspection of the return ductwork. There's an outside air intake. Yeah, it's only like an 8-inch round, so it isn't going to make a drastic difference, but... I did notice that the damper is in the closed position. This damper is closed, so there's no return to air, no outside air being mixed into the system. Eight inch round duct, no outside air. Yeah, that's going to affect things a little bit. Okay, but it's not enough to make a difference, and it still doesn't explain that high static pressure in the um, return. So outdoor air take is not properly insulated. It's going to cause condensation. Outdoor air dampers closed. There's no outdoor air ventilation air being pulled into the building. Building is in a negative pressure. It's incorrect for the health and safety of the occupants and it's also against code. We have to have that ventilation. So for the next few pictures, Let's remember some airflow basics. Air wants to flow in a straight line. Air does not like corners. Air has resistance. And air has weight. So as you take a look at the next few pictures that I'm going to show you, let's remember all of these items. Specifically, air does not like corners. So the first picture on the left-hand side here is looking down into the return plenum. Okay, this is, the, this is the back wall of the return plenum. My return duct, the air flows coming down here and then coming into the plenum. Okay, 
This is probably um, maybe a 30 inch opening here and the depth is about um, 15 inches if I had to guess. Okay, the second picture here shows the return line. It's the one on the bottom. This is my this is my outside air intake that's closed. This is another sealed piece of duct work, probably going for probably eventually going for the room it's sitting in, future design. My supply plenum is over it. Okay, so I have a very wide and narrow, I mean in terms of width and height. Okay, I have a short and wide piece of return ductwork, my main return trunk line, which is okay as long as it matches airflow requirements on a ductulator or design software. We're fine on that. So my return ductwork comes in from where it's coming from. It ends right there. In the back here, behind it, I now have a transition, so my air has to do a sharp right hand, it's a sharp turn down, and then this transitional piece, the air goes this way, behind the air handler, and then comes down and does another sharp turn into the air handler plenum, which is underneath. Okay, so you can actually see that down here. The air comes down and then does a sharp turn there. Here's a better look at this transition piece. My air is coming now here. It's coming across almost and then does a sharp 90 degree right there, comes down and then does another 90 into the bottom of the plenum. Okay, so if I lay this out, okay, Again, if I show you a bigger picture, my air is coming here, coming through there, goes down, goes across, comes down, and then at the bottom of the plenum, it's going to make another 90 to come into the air handler. So I have one, I have a 90 right here, I have a 90 right here, I have a 90 right here, and I have a 90 right here. So... I all of the, and none of these are sweeping 90s. Okay, these are all pretty sharp corners we see here. So every one of my corners is creating turbulence and resistance in my airflow. If I lay it out here, here's what's happening. I have my nice wide piece of return to ductwork main line coming in. Then behind it, we suddenly change direction of the air comes down. Okay, then my airflow has to come across here through the red and then does a sharp turn down into the purple and then does another sharp turn out into the return plenum under the equipment. So what is our cause of return high static pressure? Incorrect ductwork design. There's excessive restriction because of the number of sharp 90s. We also have an undersized connection into the return plenum. And we have a closed outdoor air intake. The solution? Need to add additional return capacity from the main return trunk into the bottom of the plenum. Okay, the green here shows the recommendation. Again, sweeping corners is what we're trying to show you. Okay, no 90 degree corners. So we want to come out here with a sort of a sweeping corner. We want to make sure we have a sweeping corner down here. Maybe someone will actually add some turning veins in here to help direct the airflow. And then it turns into the bottom side of the plenum. Would I remove the existing? No, leave it. Okay, because again, the greater the return capacity, the better off we're going to be. Airflow matters. If you do not measure... You do not know.